Now then, with a view to the blessing of God, let's turn to the letter to the Galatians again, and chapter 6, page 1341 in your Bibles, 1341, Galatians chapter 6. And reading again verses 7 to 10. So let's hear God's word. Verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good, to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And in these verses, the principle that dominates the verses is at the end of verse 7, where we read that whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And of course, as we saw last week, these verses are speaking of the flesh and the spirit, these two principles. And you'll notice from a reading of chapter 5 that it's a clear reference to that. In chapter 5, there is a reference to the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit lusting against the flesh. And so all these things come together. And obviously, I want to return with you this morning to the theme that we had from these verses last week, which is the, the conflict or the fight between the flesh and the spirit, a fight that really you could say, defines the Christian life. Uh, There's a way in which you can think of the whole of our Christian life in terms of our experience as just that. It's a conflict, a conflict, a, a life of fighting. And the fight is between the flesh and the spirit. And what I want to look at with you today is the fight itself, but mainly how we're to win it. The fight and how we are to win it, and may God help us to understand that. Now, first of all, the fight itself, and I suppose we begin with the protagonists. Who who is fighting? Who are the parties? Well, we saw that last week. It is the two natures within you if you're a Christian. Now, if you're not a Christian, of course, you only have one nature, but if you're a Christian, you have two natures within you. The first nature Paul speaks of is the flesh, and we saw that in the New Testament, the main meaning of that word is the fallen, sinful nature. That's a nature that we're born with, sadly, a fallen, sinful nature, and as we grow up, it just reveals itself for what it is. And Paul tells us here in Galatians 5 that it reveals itself in our mind and in our body. You see, we tend to think of the word flesh as just referring to the body, but it doesn't. Paul speaks of the fleshly mind. So this sinful nature comes out in our mind, it comes out in our body. And he describes it for us in verses 19 to 21. This is the evidence of the sinful nature. Here you have it, the works of the flesh. It reveals itself in in our life works. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, and so on. All these works are the fruit of our fallen, sinful nature. Now, of course, as I said a minute ago, if you're not a Christian, that's the only nature you have. Even if you sometimes think of spiritual things, and even if the Holy Spirit sometimes strives with you, and even because of your conscience and Because you're not as evil as you could be, even though you still do good in that sense sometimes, that does not change the basic principle that what motivates and animates you is a principle that is still at enmity against God. You remember that crucial verse we took up in Romans 7, Romans 8, sorry, the carnal mind is enmity against God. That is the basic principle that governs your heart. Sometimes you don't like to think it, but if you just take a good, long, hard look at your life, you will probably see that it is true. 
you are essentially in enmity against God. So really, although you may struggle sometimes with conscience, although the Spirit may strive with you, you don't really know this conflict that the Christian knows between flesh and spirit because, sadly, you are just flesh. I'll address you more in that connection in a moment. But according to the apostle and according to the word of God, what makes you different here today, if, if you're a Christian, is that, that you have a second nature. As Jesus himself said, you are not just born of the flesh because that which is born of flesh is flesh. But you are born of the spirit and that which is born of the spirit is spiritual. You have a new spiritual nature. That has happened through the Holy Spirit of God coming into your life and indwelling your heart to change it. He produces a new nature. Now, just like the old nature reveals itself in how you live, well, so the new nature, too, reveals itself in how you live. It reveals itself in your mind and in your body. And here in chapter 5 and verse 22, we're told what the fruit of the Spirit actually is. This is the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. And so, and so you recognize the Holy Spirit by his fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And in verse 24, those who are Christ's have crucified the old nature with its passions and its lusts. Now, the Christian, then, is a new man, or, of course, a new woman, but as Paul speaks of it, a new man with two natures. The old nature is there, it's crucified, but nonetheless it's there, it's the flesh, and the new nature is there, dominant, and it is the spirit, and these two natures are in conflict all the time. Now, secondly, something about the nature of this fight. In verse 17, you'll notice that we're told that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh. Now, this word lust in the Greek language here is very strong. It means a, a deep, passionate um, desire for something. So here you have a a, a, a really strong principle on both sides. You, you have the old nature lusting against the new. It somehow resists it, doesn't like it. There's something in you as a Christian, and, and you know it, <laughs> you well know it. There is something in you as a Christian that resists the new nature that has come into your life. And of course, at the same time, on the other side, the new nature that is born within you, which is in Christ's image and according to holiness, resists the old nature that it finds there. So here are the two, as it were, dwelling in the one heart and the one lusts against the other. In such a way, it says in verse 17, they lust against each other so that you do not do the things that you wish. And to be honest, I'm not sure about this, but I think he, he means both ways. I think he means both ways. That this power is so strong that sometimes when you desire to do the good, you are unable somehow to do it. At, at other times, when perhaps you desire to do something that is sinful, you are not able to do that either. These two principles are locked in combat, and they sometimes appear to cancel each other out. Now, as we'll see in a moment, that's not a completely true description of the Christian life. Sad to say it is, some people just seem to stop there and they just shrug their shoulders and say, well, what can you do about it? That's that. I'm, I'm just a sinner and uh, sometimes I'll do good and sometimes I'll do bad and that's that. Now, that's not a full picture of what the apostle says. If you stop there, you're in trouble. Your understanding is defective and your life will be seriously defective. But nonetheless, it is true that the two principles are so strong and so much at work like that against each other that they sometimes appear to cancel each other out. So that's the nature of the fight. It's an intense one. They lust against each other, these two protagonists. And just something, too, about the importance of the fight. Uh, make no mistake, as the old man said, it's a fight to the finish here. 
It's a fight to the finish. It's a deadly mortal combat. I mean, Paul says here in chapter 6, in the words of our text, in verse 8, that he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now, these are two very starkly different categories. And if, if you wonder what corruption means, you only have to oppose it to eternal life. Because obviously, sowing to the Spirit means that one day you will reap eternal life in all its fullness, in all its glory. So, that must mean that the corruption, on the other hand, is to miss out on eternal life. It's a word that is associated so often in the New Testament with the destruction of hell itself. Corruption, corrosion, decay, that's what you will reap. You will reap either the one or the other. And Paul puts it very starkly too in Romans chapter 6 to 8. He says that if you live according to the flesh, what? You will die. You will die. But if through the Spirit, he says, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, no one can doubt there that death and life refer to destruction in hell on the one hand and life with God in heaven on the other. Well, the same is true here. Reaping corruption means to be lost. And reaping eternal life means to go to heaven or to be saved. Now, you may say, well, how can that be, you see? Because surely there's only going to be one winner anyway. I mean, if a person is really a Christian, then the Spirit's going to prevail. Is that not right? Well, yes, absolutely so. That is right. If you are truly born again, and if, if it is the Holy Spirit that is at work within you, then absolutely the Spirit will prevail. But if that's the case, it will be an evidence in your life, you see. It will be an evidence in your life. Uh, this takes you back to Paul's point. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that shall he also reap. You remember last week I was telling you that the, that the major error in connection with this is it lies in thinking that you can just sow according to the flesh, but somehow you'll reap according to the Spirit. As though you went out into a field, of, a field with seed, barley seed and you scattered the barley seed expecting a wheat harvest. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Well, he says, God is not mocked either. If, if you are sowing carelessly to the flesh and you are not sowing to the Spirit, you're deceiving yourself, he says. So it may be true that there is only one winner, but in your case, you're deceived and so you're lost. You see, that is the point here. He, he is warning against this careless, carnal sense of self-satisfaction and warning against spiritual deception. He says, don't think that you can live according to the flesh and expect to go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. So certainly, if the Spirit is at work in your heart, you'll prevail, but is he at work in your heart? If there is no evidence, then he's not. You can't just go on the basis of a warm, fuzzy feeling. You can't just go on the basis of a commitment you made 20 years ago. Are you living in the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? If so, he says, you shall reap eternal life. Now, all this is very, very real, and it, it means that the buck stops with you and the buck stops with me. The fact is that I can sow today to my flesh and reap a harvest of corruption, or I can sow to the Spirit and I can reap everlasting life. So that's the conflict. Uh, we know who's fighting, and we know how intense the warfare is, and we know how serious the issues involved. It's a matter of life and death. Well then, how do we win? How can I be sure that I win this conflict? Well, first we need to understand the laws of the battle. We need to understand how the battle works. Now this is very, very important because there are some people here today probably who are struggling with sin in such a way that you feel that you're that you're being defeated. And every true Christian feels that at times. In fact, quite often. Every true Christian feels that at times, that, that I'm losing this battle. 
and that it's harder to find the marks of grace in my life, maybe even than it used to be. And it's difficult for me even to believe that I'm being sanctified at all. The true Christian can feel that and can feel it quite often. So it's, it's important. Am I winning this battle and am I going to win this battle? Well, like I say, the first thing you need to understand is the laws of the battle. You're going into the battle, you need to understand how the battle works. Napoleon once famously said that an army marches on its stomach. He meant there, of course, that the best fed or best equipped army was going to win at the end of the day. And there's an old story that came to my mind as I was uh, preparing this sermon. It was a, about a man who had two fierce dogs. I'm sure some of you will have heard this before. I heard it on many a, a fellowship meeting, a question meeting. A man had two very fierce dogs. And someone said to him, well, I wonder which of these dogs would win if they set about each other. And the man said, well, that's easy. It's the one I would feed the most. The one I would feed the most. And that's really what lies at the heart of this conflict, too. It, it's what it's all about. It's about feeding the two natures. Or as Paul speaks of it here, sowing to the natures. You see, in, in chapter 5, he's talked about the conflict between the two, the flesh lust against the spirit, the spirit lusting against the flesh. He's talked about that. He's talked about how the works of the flesh reveal themselves and how the works of the spirit reveal themselves. But it's only in chapter 6 that he takes us really to the key of what's involved in the battle, and he does it in verses 7 and 8. In verses 7, he gives us the principle. Well, he first warns us, he says, don't be deceived, God's not mocked. God operates according to law in the spiritual life as he does in the, in the natural life. Whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. And then he takes us to the heart of it. You see, he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. So it, it, it's about who you feed the most or which nature you are sowing to, sowing to. And he says, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. <clears throat> what does it mean, though, to sow? What does it mean to sow? Well, to sow to the flesh means that you do these things. You think these things, and you do these things that produce a fleshly harvest. What's a fleshly harvest? He's told you. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, so on. So it means that you do these things that produce that kind of harvest. If, if you see somebody whose life is full of these things, as Paul says, somebody who practices these things, hatred, jealousy, wrath outbursts, selfishness, murder, drunkenness, envy, notice, notice, and the like, he says. He's not finished. I think he could probably have written pages of these vices. Some of them seem to us not that big, you would never perhaps put drunkenness or ambition along with murder and adultery. But he does. It's the same anti-God principle. Some of these things are at different stages of development, but it's the same anti-God principle. But he says, wherever you see a man practicing these things, it's because he is sowing to that. In his soul bent of life, in his mind, the way he thinks, the way he lives and breathes, he's sowing to that all the time. That's, that's the life that he's building, brick by brick, a life that reveals itself in that kind of lifestyle. Sowing to the Spirit is doing the things that will produce a spiritual harvest. Verse 22 tells us what that is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control doesn't just relate to drink, it relates to sexuality, it relates to everything else, self-control. So to sow to the Spirit means that you do these things, which will mean that you produce that kind of harvest in your life. So are you feeding the flesh or feeding the Spirit? Are you sowing to the flesh or sowing to the Spirit? Now, let's go into it a little bit more. Let's, let's go into the flesh first. Now, to be honest, I'm not going to stay long on, on the flesh. Because 
Some time ago, I, I preached reasonably extensively on the way in which sin operates, and I did it in connection particularly with David and Bathsheba, a, ma a man of God, and um, how lust was conceived and it brought forth sin and so on. And we looked at that in considerable detail. So I'm not going to stay so long on it. And I also want to get to the spirit because what this passage is about is not just conflict but conquest. And if you read this passage forgetting that, you'll, you'll miss the main point. It's not just about conflict. It's about conquest. It's about dominion. So, so let's begin at the flesh sowing to the flesh. Now, he, he mentions many kinds of, of things that are wrong. You notice that in verse 19, the first four works of the flesh there have to do with sexuality. Adultery speaks of sexual relations that impinge on marriage. Fornication is sexual relationship that doesn't impinge on marriage, uh, but is sinful nonetheless. It takes place outside of the marriage bond. Uncleanness is a reference to sexual misbehavior generally. Lewdness is kind of body, um, unclean behavior, uh, the, the outskirts of it rather than the inside. He then speaks about religious sins like idolatry and sorcery, um, which can begin as innocently, as they say, as horoscopes and tarot cards and Ouija boards, but... Who knows where it can end? Of course, we should remember, too, that covetousness is idolatry, and that makes us think differently. He also speaks of relational sins that are to do with our fleshly minds, like hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, ambition, dissensions, so on, envy. Um, there are so many examples of these things. You remember how Saul was consumed with envy. When he heard the, the woman sing the song after the battle that Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands, he couldn't stand that. He couldn't stand that. He couldn't stand someone in the kingdom being a bit higher than himself. And, and that, that jealousy, that envy, eventually crystallized into a javelin that flew past David's head. Because as Jesus reminds us, hatred is the root of murder. Murder is just the fruit of hatred. It's the same sin. He tells us, too, in connection with adultery, that once, once sin has mastered us so that we lust after a woman in our hearts, we've committed adultery. It's not first degree because you haven't gone and done it. You may congratulate yourself. And right, well, not so right to congratulate yourself, but you may be thankful that you haven't gone and done it, but you've done it nonetheless. He says, in the heart, it is a deed done. It is a deed done. And you always have to watch things in their beginnings, things in their roots, sowing to things that are going to reveal themselves in certain ways. Now, sowing here is doing the things that are going to feed and arouse the flesh. And obviously, we begin in the head. We begin in our minds. In connection with this kind of principle, I've, I've quoted to you quite often a proverb that I think is very important. In fact, it's outside biblical proverbs, it's one of the most important that you could learn. Sow a thought, reap an act. Yeah. Sow a thought, reap an act. It's not finished there. Sow the act, you reap a habit. Sow the habit, you reap a character. Sow the character and you reap a destiny. You reap a destiny. And that proverb is so powerful and profound because it connects the thought to your ultimate destiny in heaven or in hell through the act of sowing. So a thought, so an act, so a habit, so a character. You reap ultimately a destiny. That's another variation of what Paul is talking about here. So obviously when we think of sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit, we begin in the head. Now, thoughts, of course, have a life of their own. I think we all know that. Um, none of us can completely be masters of our thoughts. Thoughts can just appear. <clears throat> and uh, it's important to recognize that just the mere appearance of a thought in your head doesn't make you a sinner. Um, it's, our Lord was himself tempted, which means that thoughts were placed into his head by the devil. Is that not true? 
The devil suggested that he throw himself off a temple and prove the love of God to himself, or <clears throat> that he bow down and worship him and receive the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and so on. Thoughts can be in your head. You're not particularly responsible for them. Can I make one, <laughs> without getting too, too nice in these distinctions, can I make a little exception here? Because if, if you've trained your mind to think evil thoughts regularly, then you have more responsibility for what, for what starts popping into your head. Uh, you see, the, the more you train your mind to think about evil, uh, the, least surprised, the less surprised you should be when evil thoughts just pop into your head. So that's a kind of exception. But by and large, when a thought appears in your mind, you're not particularly responsible for it. Luther had a very graphic way of speaking about this. Martin Luther said, it's a very famous saying, he said, you can't stop a bird flying over your head, but you can stop it making a nest in your hair. Now, what he's drawing the distinction between there is just a thought coming into your head and you taking it and sowing it. Sowing it. When you sow it, what happens is that you take that thought and you let it linger. And not just that you let it linger, but that you indulge it. Indulge it. Now, even stopping it linger is not easy because sometimes when you take up a fight against something, it seems to antagonize your enemy. Have you noticed that? That the minute you kind of say, well, I'm not going to think about this. Well, if I say anything to you, if I say the word lorry to you, you think of a lorry straight away, you see. If you realize that, if you say, well, I'm, I'm going to set myself against this, the other thing comes against you right away. That's true. It comes against you right away. So it's going to linger in that sense. But the point is, are you indulging it? When you indulge it, you begin to sow it. And that is already a sin. And once you linger on it like that and indulge it, you reaffirm it by taking that thing and planting it again so that it produces something else. <clears throat> Let me think of a couple of examples with you. Let's say, for example, in the first four areas here of adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Something comes into your head or perhaps you just pass it by on the street and that's not too difficult. It might be an image or something. Well, the real test comes in what you do about it. If you keep or indulge such an image, you may seek out some verbal or visual material that will stimulate that image. And when you do that, you are sowing it. And, and you are reaping an action of some kind. And, and as you sow that action itself, you're going to start reaping a habit. I was reading the other day about people who were actually caught in this kind of thing. And it's amazing how their whole lives had started to revolve around it. Their whole lives. They adjusted everything around this particular sin. And it all began, a couple of them confessed that it all began with a couple of fairly... Um, spontaneous images that came across their screens. And now their whole lives are revolved around it. What they eat, where they eat, when they eat, when they're available, when they're not available. Because the thought became an act, the act became a habit, the habit becomes your character, and that determines your destiny. Same thing is true with drunkenness here, for example, and which is associated with revelry. Revelry is a, an old word, really, for party going, where drink flows. And usually you get, you get certain things that go together on these occasions. Now, the Bible says, look not on wine in the glass when it is red. And I've said to you often before that the redness of the wine there means when it's most tempting, most alluring. Now, some people can look on a glass of wine and it's not red. In other words, it's just a glass of wine and they can take it and they go away. But others can't, for whatever reason. It just appears in its redness. Now, again, you see, you have a choice what to do about that, don't you? You have a choice. Uh, some people are so much in the grip that even when they see the image, they're, they're tempted to walk past perhaps the pub that they're regularly drunk in or... Um, Maybe they want to walk down the supermarket and just pass the aisle and just look at it or something of that kind. But you see, when you sow, you're going to reap something. 
And then when you sow that, you'll reap something else. The thought, the act, the habit, the character. Now, <clears throat> obviously it's easiest to break that chain at the level of the thought. But I want to ask a wider and a deeper question. That's how to avoid this process altogether. Very, very important because, like I say, maybe your life is in the grip of something. And maybe you're just generally in the, gri in the grip of weakness and failure. And you may say to me, look, you've spoken already about the flesh lusting as the spirit and the spirit lusting against the flesh. I mean, is it not the case that I'm just going to be in the grip of things and that's that? Well, no. After all, in chapter 5 and verse 21 here, Paul says, when he's just given the list of things that are the fruits of the flesh, he says, I've told you, I'm telling you now beforehand. Now, I don't know if he means before I see you or before the time comes at which you give account, but I'm telling you beforehand, as I've told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if these things are somehow defining in your, li your life, you're, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 24, he says that those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and its lusts, with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Notice that he's not actually speaking about a, a conflict between two equal parties. Yes, uh, sometimes you can get a strong person and a weaker person, but the, but the weaker person can sometimes surprise you with the strength that he can exert. can sometimes surprise you. That, that's the way he thinks about this. It's not equal parties, he says. As a Christian, the flesh principle has been crucified in you. And you say, well, I find it hard to believe it's been crucified. Yes. He says, it has actually been definitively crucified. As someone said years ago, it's taking a long time to die, maybe, but it's, it's crucified. You are a new man. Some people say that the Christian has a, is a new man and an old man. That's not technically true. The Christian is a new man with a new nature and an old nature. I think there's a profound difference between the two. There's a, there's a Gallic hymn that's popularized the idea of being an old man and a new man at the same time. <clears throat> You're not an old man and a new man. You are a new man, but you have an old nature as well as your new nature. And that's important even in terms of how you think of yourself. How do I think of myself as a Christian? I think of myself as a new person. I think of myself as having died to sin, as Paul says in Romans, and now living unto righteousness. I am not somehow doomed to this struggle in which nobody appears to be winning. I am certainly assigned a conflict in a battlefield. But in this conflict, one principle is supposed to be winning out consistently against the other. He may undergo a defeat now and again, but the habitus, the bent, the tendency, the dominant characteristic of your Christian life should be what? Dominion, victory, power, not bondage, loss, and impotence. Now that's important because... A certain strand of thinking can creep in which sees you creeping along saying, Oh, man, I'm, I'm just in the grip of this and I'm in the power of this. There's nothing I can do about it. Small things, big things. And, of course, you, trend, you tend to make them all small because you've got used to living with them. And there's no sense of expectancy that you're ever supposed to rise above these things. Is that right? You live all the time at the end of Romans 7 and you haven't discovered Romans 6 and you haven't discovered Romans 8. Is that right? No, it's not right. There is something fundamentally wrong there. How do you win this conflict? An important question. Friends, I'm not preaching perfectionism, right? Not preaching perfectionism. But I am preaching dominion. I want you and me, by the grace of God, to live victorious Christian lives that may stumble now and again, but are stamped with victory. Is that attainable? Well, put two verses together in this chapter, and let's see where they take you. First of all, verse 25, at the end of chapter 5, sorry, Galatians 5:25. Listen to this. 
If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. There you go. That's the first verse. If you're alive in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. The verse I want you to stick on to the end of that is verse 16. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's worth repeating. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is that defeatist? No, it's the opposite. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, okay, you may say that iniquities, I must confess, prevail against me. Do I, I say that myself too, yeah? I say that myself too. But if your Christian life is characterized by being in the grip of sins, addictions, there's something wrong with you. And I want to draw your attention to two things. First of all, the connection between living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. Let's look at verse 25 again. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Now, what does he mean by living in the Spirit? Does he mean simply being a Christian? I don't think so. He means being a lively, exercised Christian. A Christian animated, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And are you that you remember Jesus said to the disciples that, uh, he says, if you as fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, he says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? He's talking to Christians there. Christians. Now you think, oh, well, it's, it's unbelievers that need the Holy Spirit. No, you do too. You do too. Yes, of course, you, if you're an unbeliever, you need the Holy Spirit. You, he alone can bring you from death to life and to faith in Christ. But, but as a Christian, you need that Spirit too. You've got an old nature, and, and you need that Spirit to give you dominion over that nature and to put that nature progressively to death so that you will reap everlasting life. Your ongoing Christian walk is one that requires you to live in the Spirit. Live through the Spirit. Live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And how did Jesus tell the disciples to do that? Ask. Ask, he said. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Because, he says, if you, when you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Spirit to them that ask him? If your children ask you for bread, are you going to give them stones? If they'll ask you for an egg, will you give them a scorpion, which looks like a substitute when it's coiled up? No. And of course, the loaf of bread looked like a stone. You're not going to give them a, a substitute. You'll give them what they need. If your children are hungry, you'll feed them. Well, how much more will your father give the spirit? The spirit. Yes, to them that ask knock and seek and and we say we want the spirit or oh, we say we need the spirit or oh, how much we need the spirit well show god that you need the spirit then tell god that you need the spirit spend the time in the day with god that tells him that you really need the holy spirit that you value the holy spirit it's impossible for you to convince me that you know you need the holy spirit if you spend two minutes a day praying to god I can't believe you. Would you take me seriously if I said the same thing? If, if we want God in our lives, we have to plug in. We've got to make the connection. And you know that what makes the connection is prayer and the reception of the word. These are the means of grace. And if you don't take the means of grace seriously, you're not wanting grace. How can you be? The Holy Spirit of God is the animator. He is the one who enables every single facet of your Christian life. And if they're not in place, you haven't got them to the degree or the extent in which you should have them. Paul says famously, do not quench the Spirit of God. He says famously too, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. What does it mean to grieve the Spirit? 
It means to offend him. <clears throat> Is it not offensive to the spirit not, not to look for him daily? Not to value him? Not to come to God in a way that says, please send me your spirit to enable me and to empower me. Of course it's offensive. And when a person is grieved, they turn away. They turn away. Is it possible that there's a distance between you and the Spirit of God when there should be closeness? And there's a lack of power where there should be power. Power in your Christian life. And that power is just not there. Uh, see, the thing is that in the battle, battle with the flesh, only the Spirit can help you. All right, we have our part to play. Like Job. Job says in the Old Testament that he made a covenant with his eyes not, not to think uh, about a woman, a young woman. He said that, that he made a covenant with his eyes. So obviously there was a particular temptation and he made a covenant with his eyes. That's our part. We make, we make these obligations to God, these covenants. But we, at the same time, we acknowledge that the strength is from him. Turn thou away my sight and eyes from viewing vanity. That's not an abdication of responsibility. I mean, in a way, it sounds like it because it's my sight. It's my eyes. But he says, turn thou, you turn away my sight and my eyes from viewing vanity. And in your good and holy way, be pleased, he says, to quicken me. You notice he's calling on God to do that. He says, you come, you quicken me, you turn away my sight and my eyes. He never uses that sense of dependence. He never uses the sense of dependence as, a, as an excuse for irresponsibility. You turn away my eyes? Well, I don't need to bother then. I'll just hang them on here until you turn them away. He never thinks like that. He never speaks like that. But he lives and acts like a man who needs God. He needs to live in the Spirit before he can walk in the Spirit. That, I always say to you that every road we travel down in the Bible takes us back to the importance of prayer and the Word. Every road, every road, everything stops there. Everything stops there. Prayer and the Word is the source of your strength. That's why the fruit of the Spirit here, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, doesn't include prayer. Prayer is a part of living in the Spirit. It's not a part of walking in the Spirit. It's a part of living in the Spirit. It's what makes anything possible. Do you see that? Prayer is what makes anything possible. There's no prayer. None of that's going to be there. There's going to be no love, no joy, no peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They'll be conspicuous by their absence. They may, okay, they may all be present, but they're on life support machines, the lot of them, until prayer is able to bring them back to life as they should. So the first question is, are you living in the Spirit? Not are you walking in the Spirit. Are you living in the Spirit? Are you alive by the Spirit of God? The second thing is that you walk by the Spirit. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. Put them into practice. In other words, walk in love, walk in joy, walk in peace, Walk in patience, walk in kindness, walk in goodness, walk in faithfulness, walk in gentleness, walk in self-control. Again, that begins in the mind too. Um, we've got to learn to discipline our minds through prayer, to discipline our minds. Paul said to the Philippians, finally, brethren, whatever is true and noble, whatever is just and pure, clean, what's beautiful, any virtue, anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Do them, and the God of peace will be with you. Noticing he's getting them to think right. Getting them to think right. Think on good things. Set your minds on where Christ is at the right hand of God. Think of what it means to be at the right hand of God. Think of who Christ is as Lord. Think of his kingship. Think of his prophetic ministry as priesthood. Think on purity and holiness. Think on how to do good. Chapter 6 here tells us, for example, in verse 2, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 10 of chapter 6 
says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Right, right then. Sit down and think about that. Think about that. How can I do good to all people? And how can I do good to the household of faith particularly? Are there burdens I need to carry for my brother and sister? How much do you think about that? Me too. Me too with you. Are there burdens I could carry for my brothers and my sisters? And is there someone around to whom I can do good? Someone to whom I can give a helping hand? <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 that there was a man called Stephanus, and he tells us that his household had addicted themselves to serving the saints. It's a wonderful expression. They had addicted themselves to the service of the saints. <clears throat> he uses that expression perhaps to contrast it with evil addictions and evil habits. J just by thinking bad, we develop bad habits and ultimately bad characters. But by doing good things, we develop good habits, and we can addict ourselves to something like the ministry of the saints. You think of that household, think of Stephanus, and think of his family. They were addicted to helping the people of God. They loved to do it. They, they thought about how they could do it. And there are people's lives here who are characterized like that. And, and I thank God for them. People amongst yourselves, put myself to shame. You have addicted yourselves to the ministry of the saints. And it's a beautiful thing to do. Let, let your mind, your heart be on these things. And as well as thinking about them, do them. Do them. You see, friends, there's nothing automatic about any of this. <clears throat> Even when you pray for the Spirit, when you call upon the Spirit, when you think upon what's good, you still need to do it, and that requires its own energy. <clears throat> and it's easy in the Reformed Church to congratulate ourselves that we know what we should do, isn't it? That's one of the besetting sins in the Reformed Churches, that we congratulate ourselves on knowing what to do that we have the right framework of systematic theology. <clears throat> we are Calvinist. We can check that. We can check every box, and we know it all. But as Jesus famously said to the disciples as he was washing their feet, he said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. And what's the point if I can write an essay about how to serve the neighborhood? Or if I can write an essay or make a sermon about serving each other as Christians, if I don't do it. If I don't do it. And if you don't do it, why this disconnect, friends, so often in our lives be between what we know and doing it? The Spirit. The Spirit. So an act, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. And in verse 9, incidentally, of chapter 6, he says, Let's not get tired. Let's not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. That's a beautiful thought. Sometimes doing good can be tiring. Why? Lots of reasons. A, simply physically tiring. B, sometimes the people you're too good to don't even realize it. Maybe they're not even particularly thankful for it. All right, but you remember who you're doing it for at the end of the day. <clears throat> We're not doing anything for ourselves, are we? We're not doing it for human congratulation or human recognition, are we? Hope not. We're doing it for God, for God's sake. God loved us. God saved us. God helped us. We do this for God and because we love God. And when that begins to characterize our lives, self-control, not in the grip of these addictions, not in the grip of outbursts of wrath, but a disciplined Christian temper. When we are ready to serve other people and to minister to them and to help them, that, that is an outpouring of what? Of the Spirit of God. That is real love. That is real joy, real peace, real long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Let these things be seen in me and in you. See, the real, the real point I want to make tonight, to, this morning to you, is, is just that this is a battle you should be winning. It's not a draw. 
not a draw. It's a winning battle. And, and that's the kind of thing that communicates to the world. Oh, it does. For friends, the world needs salvation. Souls need to be saved. Souls here today that need to be saved. You need to be saved. And you may ask me, and I close with this, you may say, well, how can, how can I begin? Well, you know, the first act of sowing to the Spirit you do is call upon God. Call upon God. Ask God to receive you. Come to God in Christ, and you have sown to the Spirit. And as you begin, so continue. I want God willing over the next few Sabbath mornings to look with you at the doctrine of the Lord's Day, what it means to keep the Sabbath day. So I hope we start to think about these things. And may the Lord bless our thoughts. Let us pray. <clears throat> our gracious and merciful God, we thank you for the power that is available to every believer, even the power of the Holy Spirit. For if the one who raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in our own hearts, then we too can most certainly die more to sin and live more to righteousness. O oh, grant us to seek your face earnestly and daily and to seek your power that we would no longer be enslaved to any fleshly principle, but that we would be under the dominion of your blessed spirit. In our Saviour's great name we pray. Amen. Our last psalm is Psalm 138. That's page 432 in your psalm book. Page 432. The end of Psalm 138, and we're singing to the tune Winchester. Though God be high, yet he respects all those that lowly be, whereas the proud and lofty ones afar off knoweth he. Though I in midst of trouble walk, I life from thee shall have. That's the key. Against my foe's wrath thou wilt stretch thine hand, thy right hand shall me save. And here's the confidence, and we can have this confidence in Christ. You see, don't be, you know, like yourself. I can sometimes too feel quite defeated, but you've always got to get back up and get back to God and get that spirit back. Surely that which concerneth me, the Lord will perfect me. Isn't that a wonderful promise? It's a wonderful promise. Lord, still thy mercy lasts. Do not thine own hands works forsake. And I suppose his own hands work is our own Christianity. He's not going to forsake that. Where he begins the work, he will bring it forward to completion. So you get along with that yourself. The last three stanzas will stand to sing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and remain with you now and forevermore.
Amen.